Sports Director for the Sustainable Heritage. And um, many thanks to Catherine and Alejandro for really organizing all this and also to the speakers who are going to present today. Uh, this, is a, this is something we do uh, every year on an annual basis uh, for the last three, four years. And it was an idea that actually emerged uh, in discussions with the students themselves. How nice it would be to showcase some of the amazing research that the Sustainable Heritage students are producing every year. And uh, you will definitely see, although we only have uh, a few of those today, uh, you will definitely realize the diversity and the high quality and the excellence and the originality and the creativity uh, of, for each of those uh, projects. So I don't want to talk more because this is the day of, the, of our uh, alumni now <laughs> because they have finished and very successfully indeed. Uh, so I would like to introduce our first speaker, Sohini Nandi, and I had a great pleasure to supervise Sohini on the project of sustainable methods for thermal upgrading of four post-war prefab timber cities houses in the UK. And also Sohini hopefully will also have time to uh, give a short uh, presentation also on what she did after Sofini's dissertation project as part of her internship at Historic England, uh, which is nice to see how our students continue taking further the work that they have been and the education and the knowledge that have been exposed to during the year. So Sohini? No Thank you, Kalipi, for the lovely introduction. Hello, I'm Shohini. I hope you can see the screen. I'm not tall enough to block it. <laughs> okay, I'm Shohini. I'm a recent graduate. And I did my thesis on sustainable method for thermal upgrading of post-war timber prefab Swedish houses in the UK. And while I was doing the thesis work, I joined Historic England, the London planning team, to do my placement internship. I worked on a very interesting project. I was analyzing the H2 policy of the new London plan. I was looking into how heritage assets can deliver housing in London and how the process, how such developments can contribute towards preserving and enhancing the historic character. So because I will be presenting two projects, I, I'm in a bit of rush and I will tell you the key findings of all my projects. Okay, so to start with, what are Swedish houses and what are they doing in this country? After the huge destruction of Second World War, uh, the UK government decided to provide people decent housing and they exported 5,000 pairs of Swedish houses and they came as kit houses, flat packed, and then they were erected on site. So there was a uh, brick plinth and the main superstructure had softwood timber framework on the Inside portion, it had a plywood and then it had a plaster board or a fiber board with painted surface. On the external side, it had a vertical tongue and groove jointed match boarding um, or weather boarding, mostly painted black or maroonish. And these were located in rural regions because the government wanted to uh, engage the ex servicemen who had just come out of war into agricultural practices to bring forward, to take forward the country. And what was the trigger point? Why did I take up this topic? Last year, in December 2017, the 20th Century Society, which is a uh, amenity society looking into the architecture post-1940, they uh, filed an uh, objection with the Stroud District Council. Because in that council, some house owners, some Swedish house owners, had applied, uh, had made an application to apply external insulation with silicon render on the houses. And according to the society, this was going to totally destroy the exterior appearance of the houses for which the houses were known for. And because of the objection, the uh, application was withdrawn in January. During this time, they contacted me and they asked whether I'm ready to look into the topic and find a sustainable method to solve this problem. And they also applied to Historic England for listing, which got rejected by Historic England. Historic England said that uh, this house did not retain most of the original features so they did not show the values that they wanted. But they did acknowledge the fact that the houses are being recladded for their thermal inefficiency and that's the reason why most of the houses are not recognizable anymore. So that's how the project started. Because I'm in a hurry, so I'm going to rush. The objectives identified, firstly, <coughs> only two Swedish houses out of the 2,444 left right now, only two houses are listed. All the rest are unlisted. So the owners are the heritage managers in this case. 
they are the people who decide whether they what is their perception of thermal comfort. If they're not comfortable, what interventions they will undertake. They decide their balance, the heritage balance that they hold with thermal efficiency methods. So I was trying to understand their thinking. And then uh, the first function of a building is to act as a uh, buffer, as a, a barrier from the external environment. So whether the buildings were functioning properly and then to understand the different thermal interventions that thermal efficiency interventions that the owners have done to their house how did it impact their perception of the uh, heritage values and then uh, when the houses were being brought to um, brought to uk from sweden at the same time the houses were also being sent to other countries like finland like uh, france so i decided to do a case study in finland and to see what was the difference in terms of the climatic and cultural context and finally, after all this interrogation, I was going to propose a sustainable method to uh, provide a proper sustain, uh, thermal efficiency method which, which was going to uphold the significance of the house and the integrity of design. To start with, uh, because we always start by gathering data from secondary sources and this was a very difficult thing because these houses have not been academically researched well. So I had to literally start from scratch. In terms of literature review, the topic, my topic of integrating heritage values into the decision making framework for thermal efficiency methods is relatively new in our field. And I was very fortunate because Kalyup is one of the pioneers to have started this topic and she was my supervisor. And uh, some alumni from our institute, they have done research work on this topic. So I read through all their work, I was trying to understand what has been done in this field and what are the gaps. So uh, after doing my secondary um, data research, my literature review, I started my field work. And that was the most difficult part because all these houses were located in the most rural regions. I did a total of 12 interviews, out of which one was in Finland, in Helsinki. Uh, three, uh, I went and visited their houses. I did the interview. I did the conditions, visual condition survey of the houses. And the rest, I talked to the people over phone. I had email con conversations. So. Uh, yes, uh, I will just uh, brief you here. So when I went there to do my interviews, it was semi-structured interviews and in one of the houses I did the environmental monitoring for two months. I measured temperature and humidity to see how the building was performing. And uh, yeah, I did a visual condition survey to see what was the condition of the building. And all this fed into the conclusion and discussion. <coughs> Also, the, uh, the method that I adopted was is called socio-technical approach. So it's about doing the interviews, collecting that data, and relating it to the technical environmental uh, information. So uh, there are basically four typologies of Swedish houses found here in England, Wales, and Scotland. I studied two of them. This is just one of them. And I tried to understand how the people, the residents, valued their houses. This is called a causal look map. So I did the system dynamics model. I tried to understand how each of the codes and themes related to each other and how the people were reacting to the house. Did they like the house? What they liked about the house? Why they did not like the house? And all this gave rise to the heritage values that the residents or the owners associated with the house. And I can categorize it as historical, architectural, rarity, and communal. I'll just talk about the communal thing because uh, it's not just the house of the owners, it's, it also belongs to the community. It acts as a landmark and when, when the, there is a threat, and this is a real case I'm talking about, when there is a threat, the community came together to protect the house. They could not, but they came together, so it added to the community cohesion. And then when I was studying the building, uh, this is a temperature profile, humidity. Uh, okay, I'm doing it, it's not happening. <laughs> I think it's a heavy, heavy thing. And I did the mold germination isoplates and I found, this is, these are the thermal images, and I found that there was nothing wrong with that house. It was, it was perfectly all right. In fact, it was better than brick houses because there's a brick partition wall which is common. It was not functioning very well, but the rest of, of the timber structure was functioning very well. And which actually justified what the people said because the residents said they are very comfortable in the house. But the comfort was gained by some intervention that they had already done in the house. And they justified that the interventions they had done, mostly by replacing the windows, adding loft insulation, and uh, 
uh, small things like that, uh, covering the porch and things like that, they said it added to their value to, towards the liking of the house. It did not have any harmful impact on their liking or the values that they held for the house. And this was my Finland case study. I did the similar thing, the similar approach was adopted for the Finland thing. And uh, the people there, it, it's a di slightly different case because in Finland the houses were located in rural and in urban regions and they were always clustered together. So this whole neighborhood is called the Swedish house neighborhood and it's a conservation area. So they do have regulations, so they cannot do anything that they want towards the house. But the, um, the sort of pride, the understanding towards wooden houses is much more in Finland. And they appreciate the houses, what they are, and they do not want to change anything in the houses, which is a bit different from the, what is happening in UK. As for my final discussion and conclusion, first thing, the residents and the owners, they did value their house in their own way. And it was not just the residents, it was the whole community which valued the house. Um, upon my technical investigation, I did not find any fault with the building envelope. It was uh, performing perfectly after all the inter small interventions carried out. So why were these changes happening? Is, was thermal efficiency the only root cause? It was not. There are many other drivers and prohibitors to exchange. One is because they are unlisted, so people do not have to file for a listing process if they want to make a change. It's very easy to make an application towards the council and get the changes done. First thing. Secondly, uh, it's the financial institutions because in UK, post-1945 timber buildings are not given as much respect. People do not value them as much. So when they try to sell their house and when somebody tries to buy that, they do not get enough mortgage, they do, do not get loans. So the price price, the real, real estate value, keeps on dropping. And that's when the people lose respect for these houses. And they try to cover up the house with a silicon render and make it look like any big building. Mm -hmm. Because that's what people like more. And thermal efficiency, of course, it is a trigger. But people always value the, value the heritage uh, things a lot. And they sort of have a balance between that. They are not trying to spoil the whole house. And the limitation to my study was, because it was a study of only like three months, so the environmental monitoring was done only for two months, I did not study all the typologies, I did not speak to a big range of people, but I believe my research has started off, has triggered off something that, of course, Kalupi has started, but then I hope it will be carried on, uh, because it leads to a sustainable management of heritage, where we professionals also give respect to the heritage managers like owners, residents, who are actually living in them because they are not archaeological ruins, they are houses. They are houses of families. They want to be comfortable in them. They want to value their houses and be comfortable. So I think it has contrib contributed towards uh, sustainable management of heritage. And I've already taken 10 minutes, I think. But I'll still carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could have two more. <laughs> you are so kind. So, uh, my historic England placement work. This is again very interesting because um, the objectives which I um, chalked out for myself were for <coughs> firstly to look into successful case studies of small site housing and heritage assets and to see what made them successful and to draw out distinct principles which could be applied elsewhere. And then to, to come up with a long list of heritage at risk sites which showed the potential of delivering small site housing and then to take out one this one uh, site from the long list and to come up with a planning and design brief for its development. So uh, I had a long list of 80 case examples uh, and I filtered all of them down and, and it came down to the 10 best examples and they included redevelopment of corner plots, um, redevelopment of a garage site and they can be either heritage assets or, either they, can, or they can be located in a conservation area. So uh, redevelopment of garage site, re redevelopment of backland industrial sites, restoration, refurbishment of heritage buildings, sensitive subdivision of buildings, new developments within the setting of a heritage building, and many things like that. And it was an, uh, very deliberate, it was spread all over London, the case studies, to show the potential of all of London and how these case examples portrayed and worked on the specific character of that part of London. So I came up with this flowchart, um, 
this flowchart can actually lead towards a sensitive, sensitive intervention. So it starts with a critical search for a potential site. So you really have to look uh, maybe at his heritage at risk sites or anything and then uh, think about the policy context. I will shift towards the recommendation because Katrin has already shown me the hand. So after the critical search, look into the policy context. What's the policy at national, regional, local levels? What the site has to offer? What, the, what are the constraints of the site? Revision of listing status can sometimes lead towards more development. Planning and design brief, because this is the most helpful starting point and they can act as a yardstick all throughout the development process of the site. And then pre-application engagement, and this is something which was common to all the case examples. They all engaged with the local authority with historic England before they made the final application. And then uh, I picked up one site from the heritage at risk list. It's a disinfecting station in Hackney. I worked on that with the help of the lovely architects of the team, our team, and I came up with a planning and design brief, which talked about the potential of the site, the surrounding of the site, the potential of the site, the constraints, and the guidelines that the person, the developer, has to keep in mind while developing the site. So I made something like uh, called a guideline and then an illustration how that can be carried out. So with the help of the architects, I uh, converted some of the buildings into housing, the main disinfecting station into a space for creative industry and how that can be achieved in a sustainable way, and a row of new built townhouses to sort of cross-subsidize the restoration work. So it's about achieving some new builds, restoring and refurbishing the existing one and having sustainable development and del delivering small site housing. Thank you. Questions before we <laughs> before we continue with the next presentation. Any questions? You can get hold of me the value submission. I was interested um, when you were saying that it was the sort of the mortgage companies who were quite suspicious of these buildings yes. being timber framed yes. and not yeah. yes. and um, and so you were saying that they were kind of wishing to disguise the fact that they were yes. timber-framed. Because uh, when I did the interview with one of the couples, they said that when they were trying to sell off <coughs> their other Swedish house, mm -hmm. uh, when people came to see, see the house and they went back and they were applying for a loan, the uh, financial institutions they did not want to give a mortgage or a loan mm -hmm. because they said this was not fireproof, it was like very vulnerable to fire. Mm -hmm. And that's why they had to lower the price of the house and the family sold it off at a very cheap rate. And then when the new person bought the house, even before staying in the house and feeling how the house feels, he rendered the house. He put external insulation, he ren rendered the house because he just wanted to hide the fact that it was a timber house. He wanted to make it look like any other brick or stone building. So this was a fact, real fact. So you said the fact that sort of specialists have been interested in the 20th century society, yes. that was actually improving the status of the house. So so, uh, because uh, the 20th century society, they got mm. interested in the yeah. whole problem yeah. because they were getting clad. But when they applied for the listing, that was rejected. Mm. Because these houses have not been listed for so long. Mm. So for, for this duration, people have mm. changed the original features. Mm. So, and the historic England, through their t critical approach mm. towards listing, they said it does not mm. hold enough evidence that <coughs> they have all the original features, they have all the values. What they totally overlooked, which I found in my research, is the communal value. It's not just the personal relation or the architectural value, it's the communal value. People feel close to it and they feel it's the neighborhood of the Swedish house. That's the Swedish house. It's a landmark. May I, may I ask another thing? I mean, I, I'm not an expert in this. Um, but how do mortgage companies ask if you were buying and you had a medieval timber frame building? That's why I said post-1945 timber buildings. Yeah. That's not enough. But would the mortgage them. companies, they would they'd respect the value of that building? They wouldn't say... In terms of mortgage companies, I will not be able to answer your question yeah. because I have not yeah. researched. I yeah. have not. I don't know, so I don't yeah. want to give you a false answer. No, no, no I'm just but wondering. That's, just, that's yeah. what the residents have told me, yeah. that they have not got enough offers because it was a timber house. And that was actually 
uh, again supported by another person also. Mm -hmm. She was also Swedish. And I think Swedish. I remember well because uh, in one of the houses when we were together mm -hmm. and we also looked at we did some archival research. Yes, 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 yes. We looked at documents <coughs> and emails that the residents have exchanged over the last years. Yeah. At some point, they wanted to sell them. Yes, if I remember yes, well. And yes. I think that was the issue of the fact that it's a timber structure and they have issues with the bank yeah. because the bank doesn't want to give yeah. the mortgage. Yeah. Yeah. And I, if I remember so well, it was mentioned in one of those yes, kind of yes, really yes. long list of emails. Yeah. That kind of, uh, and also when the surveyor came to survey the house and give like a certificate or something, he said it's a timber house and you're not going to get, an, get enough price out of it. It's a timber framework house. Mm -hmm. So they're not stable enough, but they have been standing for so long. Mm -hmm. And I did not find any, any building defects in them. Mm -hmm. They were in very good condition with, without any mold growth. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you something? How did your studies for the MSC uh, help you with the work that you did at Historic England and how kind of you advanced further as a result of the experience that you got at Historic England? Uh, to start with, what Historic England was looking at uh, delivering housing to small sites, small heritage sites, is again about sustainable management of sites. So if you have a heritage, especially a heritage at risk site, and it's not being used, it has lost its touch with the community. How you can bring back the site to use by delivering housing. And housing especially is something, you live in a house for like 24 hours. You're constantly in that. You feel connected to the house. And when you bring back a site, a plot into use, you're not only benefiting that, that just site or that building, you're benefiting the whole community, the whole city. So I think that's what I learned through my course, is the sustainable management is not only about the site, it's about the bigger neighborhood, it, uh, it's about the bigger city. Mm -hmm. So the outcomes and the impacts of converting these risk sites into something usable actually filters through the boundaries of a site and it connected it back. So I think my whole learning of the MSc actually helped in my historic England work. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll have to move to the... Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
to preserve these books for the future. And the objectives were uh, to determine uh, paper chemical properties with reference to uh, their places and dates of publication, and to evaluate the level of the deterioration of the books and register other possible damages, and to analyze the environmental and physical conditions of the space, uh, the, of, the, of the cottage uh, where the books are displayed, and to assess the values of the collection uh, uh, through the visitor perception and uh, finally to estimate the longevity of the, collection, of the collection according to different conservation parameters. Uh, the methodology, uh, it was a combination of quantitative and qualitative data. Uh, it was a mul multidisciplinary approach so uh, the first stage was uh, <coughs> doing a um, literature survey, seeing the places and the dates of publication of the books to kind of um, track their chemical properties, then to analyze the environmental data uh, that relates to the agents of deterioration that has to do with uh, pests, light, and temperature, relative humidity, and then perform a condition assessment uh, a visual and tactile condition assessment of uh, some books and also to perform a historic fabric assessment only of the two rooms where the collection is. Uh, also I um, asked some of the visitors about their perception of the values of the collection and finally I um, used an, a statistical tool to estimate the, the life of the, of the books. So the first step was, as I said, um, tracking the, the dates and places of publication of the books and I found that most of the books are from the, from, from the 20th century and uh, some of them are also from the 19, uh, 18 and 17th century, but very few of them. Uh, well, as I said, in total uh, there were 3,576 books, and 70% of the books were printed between uh, the 1920s and 1950s, and 87% of the books are European, and most of them are from the UK and with this information I was able to um, compare to uh, a study that already exists in the Institute and to get the uh, pH level and also the degree of polymerization uh, value of the paper from this particular uh, era. Um, then I conducted a visual and tactile assessment uh, using um, the conservation spreadsheet which contained all of the information uh, about the condition of the books and I selected the books that were in the worst condition and also I uh, created a survey form based on one existing one from Susan Keynes and um, I was able to register the types of damages and the level of damage and other features such as uh, the kind of binding and if they were annotated or, or not and if the annotations were made with pencil or pen and other uh, features of the books. So the number of, of items were uh, 68 and the damages found were 16 which I will show you now. Uh, so I classified the damages in uh, minor, uh, medium, and major. Uh, these are some examples. Uh, the minor damages were uh, dirt, uh, were also uh, books that were curled, uh, grazing that is caused by pests, uh, fraying that has to do with uh, lifting of the covers, and this particular case is a cloth uh, cover. 
and undercut pages. Mo many of the books uh, had the problem that on the top of the of the pages that they were like stick together, and I couldn't understand why because they were kind of very like close together. And then I found that it was uh, kind of a production uh, problem. Um, the medium damages were uh, bloom, uh, foxing that I found a lot, and it has to do with uh, humidity. Uh, loose when the covers and the pages are uh, detached, and abrasion uh, felting when the pages uh, fell uh, swallow, and tear mostly on the edges. Um, the major damages were uh, blocking and sticking. This is different from the um, undercut pages because this was actually caused by um, moisture and the pages were... I, I, I was able to kind of separate them but they were... Um, because the books are not used, they, they were very difficult to, to separate. And um, Brittleness as well. The some of the books were so damaged that they were uh, kind of crumbling on the edges. Uh, fading, which is caused uh, because of the light. Uh, moldy. Uh, there was an issue that I will mention uh, where in in a, in a particular space uh, on one of the rooms uh, there was a, a damp issue. So many of the books had. A lot of mold and uh, break and detached as well. So this is a summary of the damages that I found and for the major damages as you can see here um, the fading problem is the one that I found the most and the medium damages uh, foxing a lot of uh, books have foxing I mean this is out of uh, 68 books and a lot of work <coughs> as well. Then I analyzed the environmental data. Uh, this is the location of the uh, of Sissinghurst. Um, I got data from three data loggers. Uh, one was placed in uh, the entrance of the pro property in the exterior and two uh, loggers were placed in, inside the cottage and this is the plan of the two rooms where I was working um, so you can see here uh, the red dot is the position of the data loggers um, then uh, the sun symbol is uh, the light sensors and the uh, blue one is the uh, uh, blue blue decimeters that I will explain later. Um, so this is the data that I collected from those uh, temperature and relative humidity data loggers. Uh, the exterior, um, <coughs> uh, it's uh, the average is uh, 11 uh, degrees, and uh, as you can see, the sitting room. And, the, and Harold's study, which are the two rooms within the cottage, uh, the relative humidity and temperature is quite uh, similar. It's uh, on average 17 and 16, and relative humidity um, 68 and, no, 50, 58 and 61 percent. Um, so, yeah, you can see here on the graphs how the data behaves. Um, the one on the right is uh, temperature and the one on the left uh, relative humidity. Then I uh, compare this data um, according to, the, to some of the standards. Uh, first of all the National Trust Guidance that has uh, an lower limit for temperature of 5 degrees and upper limit of 22 degrees and for relative humidity 40 and uh, the upper limit is uh, 65 so in accordance to this the 
the data that I collected is behaving well uh, for the sitting room and Harold study since uh, there's a percentage, percentage of uh, fitness uh, within the specification of uh, 90% but uh, with the, uh, comparing to the British standard um, there's a problem in Harold's study in regards to uh, relative humidity which is under uh, 50% and also comparing to the Australian Institute of Conservation uh, of Cultural Materials uh, it's um, re relative humidity in both rooms are very uh, under the, the standard as well as the heating, ventilation and air conditioning uh, but the, the one that uh, was of most concern here was uh, the one for the British standard, since uh, the the two others uh, care more for uh, the collection that are in a different uh, storage environment and also uh, for human comfort. And this is the same information with the plots of the data that, that I collected and how we it fits within the standards that I previously mentioned and these are the isoplet uh, uh, graphs where sh uh, it shows that there is no risk of molar germination uh, even when the relative humidity um, levels are too high So then I uh, collected data uh, regarding light uh, for two months in June and July and uh, I, I found that the, the levels are very high in, compar in comparison to the suggest suggested uh, levels which is uh, dangerous <laughs> and that's why the fading it's happening to many of the of the bindings and also there were there was data uh, <coughs> collected by these blue wool decimeters from uh, 2017 and it shows as well that in one of the rooms uh, the levels are very high compared uh, to as the recommended ones and hence this happened most of the uh, bindings and the spines specifically were uh, fading. And then I also analyzed the pe pest data. Um, there were uh, four traps set in the two rooms. The number one is in uh, press N in the sitting room, and number two, uh, four, and three are in uh, presses. Uh, e, F, N, J. And these were the findings. I found a lot of silverfish, um, mealworm beetle, uh, wood lice, and fungus, fungus, and a spider. And from this list, the only uh, hazard to the collection is really silverfish because it eats uh, paper. And then we had this problem. Um, that the uh, silverfish started eating many bindings and it was uh, I, I found this from the from the 68 books I found this problem in four books uh, then I performed a building assessment uh, this is the plan of the of, of the south cottage the, the ground floor only and so these are the elevations and I mapped the problems that the building had um, I found that uh, it has cracks on the ceiling and some walls a lot of them especially in the study in the um, east um, facade um, and then I realized that this had to do with the presence of a lot of vegetation there is a very big tree 
as you can see in picture number one. Uh, and also there's a gutter that is uh, often um, covered by, by leaves so it then like water cannot go down. So there was a problem that happened uh, two years ago in the upper floor where the toilet is and as you can see in picture number three there's a very big stain of them and all of that part of the wall is uh, very humid so most of the books in that section are damaged uh, by mold and so overall there were no major damages just uh, on the internal walls there's there's damp and minor cracks on the ceiling there's uh, damp and cracks as well uh, the floors are in a good condition the external walls uh, some bricks are uh, weathering and the doors and windows are in a good condition. Yeah. So then I uh, conducted a visitor assessment um, getting uh, 105 responses uh, through a th thick box uh, questionnaire and I found that most of the visitors think that the collection is important for understanding Harold's Nichol Harold Nicholson's history and uh, the, the books are essential for the character of the space and um, the visitors uh, found interesting that uh, the books, books contain annotations and they would like the collection to uh, continue to be displayed for the future uh, also 61% uh, of the people uh, thought that the collection is in a good condition and half of them uh, mentioned that they will like uh, the collection to last for more than what, one uh, thousand years. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's very optimistic. Uh, uh, and most of them disagreed that the books should be uh, placed in another environment, like in cold storage, uh, even if that means that uh, the books will last more time. And. Um, 75% would like to see the annotations from the books. Uh, then uh, the final stage was uh, conducting a life predictive analysis through some uh, statistical models. Um, and the, 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 the tool that I used was uh, an Excel form that had all uh, data from a seven year collection that uh, this information was already um, in the institute uh, and it was developed by uh, Professor Mattia. So with the data of uh, the pH and degree of polymerization, I was able to uh, use this data and compare it to the books that I was analyzing and then uh, kind of play with the relative and temp relative humidity and temperature uh, to simulate uh, the conditions of cold storage, the um, parameters of the British standard, uh, uh, conservation heat yield, the humidification, and the National Trust guidance. And these were the results. Uh, so this table summarizes the, the previous uh, conservation parameters. Um, so I found that the, the best uh, scenario would be the cold storage, obviously, because it will increase the life of the collection by more than uh, 5,000 years, but that will mean that books will need to be put in a different place and the space will be empty then. Uh, so if books are kept in the same place, the best uh, method maybe should be uh, the humidification and um, use the, the British standard parameters so they will last more time. Um, so these are the graphs that were produced by the, the tool that I was using. 
and this compares the collection uh, that is mm, the acidified, uh, the the purple line and the red line is the collection non uh, as, that remains acidic as it is now. Um, so these are the the plots of the table that I showed you previously, and this is kind of a summary. I don't know if. if uh, yeah, this is a summary of uh, the the purple part is if the collection is the acidified, and using the the first line is um, the 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 maximum percentage of the collection that that will that will that will last, uh, and the medium line is uh, the the half of the collection and then the the third line is the when the collection will will uh, die basically <laughs> so um, so yeah you can see here how cold storage will obviously make that the collection last for more than 5,000 years and then uh, the next uh, better option should be the British standard and then the humidification and then uh, conservation heating, which by the way is the one that the National Trust is using at the moment. And uh, according to the parameters that the uh, National Trust uh, recommends, uh, the collection will last the least. And so, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we have time for one question. Do you know what the National Trust plans to do with this collection now? Will they change anything? Uh, yeah, uh, they mentioned that they will uh, change the conservation heating for the humidification. Okay, mm -hmm. right. great. <laughs> <laughs> so they're listening. Yes. <laughs> okay, I think we should move on to the next speaker, so thank you very much. <laughs> Did become uh, familiar with her work as she was as she was progressing, and it's a very uh, very hot topic, but a very uh, very original as well because I think it's one of the very first studies along uh, along the lines of the, the gender pay gap in in the heritage sector heritage uh, a sector that in fact has a proportionately large uh, number of women in it. Um, so really interesting topic that has caught the attention of many and I think you've been invited to present your work in other places and I, I'll really appreciate if you can let the audience know a little bit about that as well. But the floor to you. Alex. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to apologise in advance for some of the depressing stuff for the women. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is positive stuff as well, um, I promise, maybe. Um, so I decided to focus my dissertation on the gender pay gap in UK heritage organisations, given that as of April 2018, for the first time ever, gender pay gap data of companies with over 250 employees became publicly available in the UK. This presented a unique opportunity to analyse the extent to which large UK heritage institutions are meeting the challenges of gender inequality in the workplace. The gender pay gap is the difference in the hourly wage of all men and women across a workforce. It is not about equal pay for the same work which is illegal, it's about how, how many women are getting higher pay positions in senior management and obtaining leadership roles. The results of the data collected in April were pretty bleak and I'm sure we all recognise some of this stuff that's coming up. Um, but where does the heritage sector, sector sit amongst all of this? So I did some preliminary analysis of the gender pay gap of these 47 heritage organisations with over 250 um, employees um, and yielded some interesting results. 
So, for example, when looking at the national average, this is the national one, um, of the percentages of women and men in each pay quartile, from lowest to highest, and the women are in the blue, um, the, uh, we get almost a perfect axis. So there are much higher proportions of women in the blue in the lower pay quartile, and much lower in the upper pay quartile, and then the opposite for um, men. So this is the average situation across the workforce for the UK. And then if we look specifically at the heritage sector, um, it's a slightly different picture. Um, and we, we can see more women than ever sort of getting into those senior roles and pushing through that glass barrier. But then we still have the largest disparity being in that um, upper pay quartile here, where we've still got the men sort of shooting up and, and getting most of those positions. So it's not representative. Um, of, the, of the women in the workforce as a whole. Um, so we need to understand what's going on here. So this informed my research questions. Why is the gender pay gap lower than the national average? Um, what are the barriers for women in obtaining senior leadership roles and why do they exist? And how can these barriers be eliminated? In order to answer these questions, um, I analysed gender pay gap reports from those um, institutions and interviews were conducted with um, experienced heritage professionals. So I sent speculative emails which resulted in 18 interviews with directors, HR directors and executive staff members, 14 of whom were on that uh, first list that I sent. So examples being um, English Heritage, uh, the Imperial War Museum um, and, and other institutions like that. Um, and then these were the questions which I, which, I, which I thought up to match with my research questions, obviously I'm not going to go through them all, but just to show you some of the, the thinking behind how I was going to conduct it. And then I transcribed and coded the results of those. They were mostly telephone um, conversations about half an hour long. So, the results then. Um, all of this was just supposed to provide a springboard for discussion. None of this is definitive explanations or solutions to anything in the heritage sector. It was just to see uh, what, what's going on and unpick it a bit. So why is the gender pay gap lower than the national average? Um, it was found that there were two key drivers to the smaller gender pay gap, both the result of the feminization of the industry. Like Alejandra said, we've got mostly women now, um, about over 60% uh, in, in the heritage sector. So we refer to that as a feminized industry. Um, uh, and this first one then, the senior women driver, the first driver, um, these quotes, uh, I'll show you a lot of quotes, we won't go through more, but um, show that there are more women than ever in the sector and lots of these are getting through to uh, the higher paid jobs. So visibly more, visibly less dominated by men at the top, something's not attracting as many men, um, and by law of averages we, we would have more women at the top. So we've got the senior women driver, but why is that the case? Um, heritage is often perceived as a values-centred industry. Research shows that women tend to care more about the usefulness of their work. Therefore, the perceptions of the sector could factor in career decisions, create gender imbalances, and establish occupational segregation, which is where we see genders uh, uh, co uh, congregated in different occupations. Additionally, the sector lends itself more readily to flexible working, which is often more traditionally assumed by women due to care responsibilities. The increase of female senior staff has also led to more extensive access to role models, support systems and networks, encouraging more women to apply for senior roles. So that's sort of driving more women in general, but also more women towards the top. However, unfortunately, research confirms that the higher the proportion of women who work in an occupation, the lower the average pay within it. Combined with the lack of funding and competition for entry-level jobs, this depresses pay and leads to a smaller gen pay, gender pay gap overall. So because there's less of a difference, um, there will be a, a lower um, gender pay gap. Um, so the drivers of our lower gender pay gap are both an advantage and a disadvantage to women. So more women in senior positions, but lower pay across the board. Um, and less low pay of the sector as a whole is remedied, there is little potential for a female-led heritage sector to contribute to a lessening of the gender pay gap on a societal level. Um, 
Right. And there are other sectoral characteristics as well. So um, positive ethos, um, ethicality and changing recruitment practices um, also help to reduce a bias in the sector and address gender inequality. So this is some of the positive, some of the negative stuff of why we've got a lower uh, gap. But there's also still a gap. So <coughs> why is that gap still there and what specifics the heritage sector about that? Um, a handful of participants <coughs> experienced institutional sexism compounded by wider societal prejudice. However, overall it was evident that overt sexism linked to the old boys network is much less pre prevalent. But there were a few examples where women felt that that had maybe um, disrupted their career progression. Um, gender bias of boards who appoint uh, senior positions uh, was attributed to generational and elitist influences as well as a gender imbalance in their makeup. Within the sampled heritage organisations, it was found that 68% have male directors and 67% of their board of trustees were male. This results in, or this is an example of vertical segregation. So we've got occupational segregation going on where there are more women overall, but also there's that glass barrier, there's that uh, vertical segregation as well. Um, this is a result of leadership theory, which emphasises how good leadership behaviours, or good leadership behaviours, have been socially constructed through gendered systems. Assertiveness and decisiveness, supposedly masculine qualities, are often prized over leading with emotion and empathy, the feminine traits, despite the positive benefits of leading with the latter. There is an assumption now that senior roles are granted on merit. However, if definitions of merit are determined by a patriarchal norm, and in the context of the museum sector, by a male public school Oxbridge elite and subsequently male-dominated boards of trustees, then leadership qualities will be defined in male terms. On the other end of the scale, we also have a greater number of women employed in the lower pay quartiles, increasing the gap. Um, in part due to the plethora of overqualified women seeking a way into a competitive sector that's attracted to females through entry-level jobs, but also attributed to their employment in lower skilled roles in cleaning, retail and catering that are often associated with women due to their flexible and seasonal nature, enabling a balance with care or responsibilities. Such large numbers of women in the lower paid jobs means that despite higher numbers further up the ladder, it's still not representative to the number of women as a whole employed by the sector, so it skews, it skews those results. Whereas if we had more ma males in these lower pay positions, then actually the, the gap wouldn't be so big. So it's both at the top and at the bottom as well. Um, there's also a lack of promotion opportunities as a result of the large supply of entry-level professionals and low senior staff turnover. The latter is in part due to favourable, albeit now historic, pay progression packages, as well as fewer men taking career breaks or seeking promotion in other organisations. Carer responsibilities came up frequently as, as women mostly take those on, which is also known to increase the gender pay gap. So again, some quotes here to summarise some of the issues that came up um, when you take career breaks or take flexible working hours and so on. And finally, lack of confidence was often cited as one of the biggest barriers to obtaining senior roles. Um, again, alluding to asking for pay rises, not being able to talk confidently about achievements and inner confidence and so on kept coming up. So, how can these barriers then be eliminated? So there's lots of good things going on, but what else can the heritage sector do? So disregarding change beyond the scope of the heritage organisations, so societal change, what can, what can we do? So a board that is representative of its workforce in the community, which heritage institutions serve, and one that recognises the benefits of alternative ways of leading that lend themselves to wider social transformations, would play a significant role in breaking the glass ceilings. So not the white man with an MA from the Courtauld, as participant 14 said. Um, networking, mentoring and support systems that I mentioned previously, for a reason why there might be a lower gender pay gap, we need to do more of that. Um, and the confidence that many of the female leaders gained um, in obtaining and performing their roles were evident during interviews and, and were alluded to being a result of these systems that were in place, so there needs to be much more of that. 
And finally, with a growing number of female role models and leaders, there is an opportunity to undermine that leadership theory through modelling alternative ways of leading. So participant 14, I feel strongly as a female leader that I need to give an alternative way of being managed and of leading. Um, and essentially not modelling male behaviours and embracing the fact that uh, they're not trying, trying to be like men and actually um, seeing that there are different ways of doing it which are just as good and sometimes better. Um, and one of those, I remember her saying that she hated networking and they just did this, and she said it's one of those quite weird things that men have come up with and <laughs> her, her other female leaders came up with a different way of doing it and made their own network and much rather, much, much more enjoyed that. And I think it involved lots of wine. <laughs> um, so, in conclusion then, the heritage sector faces many challenges um, in regard to its gender pay gap, low pay, a lack of diversity on boards of trustees, this is where it gets really present, sorry, lack of promotion opportunities and oversupply of qualified graduates, that's all of us, um, and ironically, a uh, lack of men. However, um, there are, uh, the research also highlighted a plethora of good recruitment practices, encouraging case studies, positive working cultures, a sincere commitment towards creating a fairer and more equal workforce, and a number of extremely talented, inspiring and proactive female leaders who are modelling alternative ways of leading. As such, the sector is well positioned to become a leading example in the UK of gender equality in the workforce. Considering heritage organisations themselves can be drivers of social and political change, it's even more important that the workforce represents the diversity of the community that they serve. In terms of future research, continued monitoring of the gender pay gap and progress made across the heritage sector is crucial. More research should be conducted on pay gap differences between type and location of heritage organisation to identify new patterns and make comparisons. Furthermore, almost every participant um, recognised the need for wider diversity in the heritage sector workforce beyond that of gender um, and additional research into this as more data becomes available as we are entering a reporting future where everything like the gender pay gap reporting everything will be reported on in terms of ethnicity and, and, and so on so as more data becomes available um, we need to we need to do more research on that since gender discrimination is compounded by additional forms of oppression based on race class sexual orientation ability and so on an intersectional study of all of these would provide a 4D perspective on the gender pay gap. Mostly, I do have it on a on the yeah, other document, but mostly directors and HR directors. Yeah, in fact, no, no one below senior management. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, you said that you uh, there's been interest in in you presenting to other other places. Can you tell us more about that? So mm -hmm. this is it's only it's only one actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the National Museums Director Council, uh, which is comprised of I think forty one of the major museums across um, the UK, um, or, or like the major national ones, and the uh, chairman who I spoke to wants me to present at their HR forum on, in December. Okay. And, I did, and I spoke to quite a few of them, I hounded quite a few of them actually. <laughs> um, so, um, some of them will probably reference me, but uh, yeah, so I don't know what they get out of it. So it may, it may be just one place, but with a uh, big reach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great position to be in. It's like all the HR. <laughs> yeah, you could be employers. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, were the organisations that you were speaking with themselves surprised by these findings? Or? No, absolutely not. No one was surprised at all. I think everyone was, um, in fact, like everybody said that 
obviously we want a better situation, but they were, most people were heartened by the fact when they saw the preliminary analysis that I did, they were pleased that the heritage sector was doing better than the rest of the UK, but also acknowledged there was a long way to go. Did you get a sense from the women in senior positions that they had to change to behave more like men <laughs> in order to reach these um, positions? I think they definitely is. Uh, there's now this this network called the Women Leaders in Museums Network, which is a really incredible network made up of forty of the top women leaders in in um, museums at the moment. So. Uh, well, there's that, like the Imperial War Museum and what well, they're, they're all over, but they, um, yeah, I think they needed to make that so that they could. I mean, one of them referred to um, before. It's changed now, but when she started out um, in her in her first position, quite senior position, she'd go to um, this local authority museum forum, um, and the male directors refer to themselves as the gods. And she directly said because they were, they were men, they felt that they could. Or well, that's the impression that she got. And they no longer refer to themselves as a god. But I think they were. I think they've got to where they have actually because they haven't behaved in those um, characteristics that you might. I mean, this is so generalised, and this is it's quite painful to be so generalised about it all. But um, yeah, I think they've really had to not do that. But they've definitely seen people doing that. And it's not necessarily been beneficial. Yes. Just, just my experience, I, um, I worked for English Heritage and uh, worked about 15 years ago, and I realised I was conservative and being paid less than my male comparator. So I took the union and did all this. Um, and part of the reason doing that is because I wanted to encourage other women to kind of do this sort of thing. So, so I'm sort of as tough as old nails, so I just go in and say, look, I'm the best person in the world doing this. And the unions love this, because they just yeah. like my kind of arrogance. And that. I mean, that, that's, that's sort of a double-edged sword, because you end up being caught. Somebody says, fun with you, Helen, if you're an assertive woman. Oh, yeah. I know. And kind of like being, you, know, you wouldn't say that was an insult to call a man an assertive man, but that sort of thing. Um, but at the end of it, when I actually kind of said, no, 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 I should be paid, why should I be paid, no, 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 and the union just loved it. So in the end, I sort of got paid a substantial back load of money yeah. and an increase, so I was paying the same as um, But then I had to sign um, a kind of secrecy, so I'm not allowed to say it, and probably I'm kind of, you know, they're all coming through me now. And I was thinking, um, <laughs> the whole point of me doing this was to say, hey, look, yeah. girls, mm -hmm. I sort of, I just stuck to it. Um, you know, I'm not just doing it for me, I'm doing it for you as Absolutely. well. But then I have to sign this, this clause. I mean, is that something that still exists that you know of? Not that I know of. Yeah. Um, but I mean, if you want my data, I've still kept the files. <laughs> the files. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is, that is totally illegal. Mm -hmm. um, so well, I mean, I had, I had, um, I had um, evidence. My, one of my managers said, oh, Miss Hughes will probably have a second child and will resign. That's why I wasn't viewed for promotion. Yeah, I mean, that's terrible. just... Unfortunately, I've heard stories like that mm -hmm. recently. Yeah. I've got the papers if you want them. If you want yes. them, if you want them, to, uh, I mean, how has it happened in the past? The dissertation should be a really um, mm -hmm. enjoyable activity, but so this was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of depressing stuff, and I was just like... Um, but you shouldn't but you should get depressed because you're helping things for the future. Yeah, absolutely. And there was so much positive stuff coming out and I spoke to such incredible women that were actively changing the situation. Um, and it is already in a positive situation compared to the rest of the UK, as long as we accept no pay. As in like, as a, as a sector. But, um, yeah. <laughs> And actually now we're considering doing the network here. Yes, potential. we have been thinking of uh, developing a network on women in heritage, which is a little bit broader. Mm -hmm. It's not just mm -hmm. about women working in the heritage sector, mm -hmm. which will be one of mm -hmm. these, but also women doing research in heritage, but also research on women in heritage. It will be that in different strands mm -hmm. with Alice and one of the PhD students.
So now we move to the last presentation for for the evening. Uh, a very interesting dissertation subject uh, from Andrew Rosen. Uh, Andrew did the masters in two years, uh, like two years, three, three years, years. <laughs> three years. Taking time. Um, a very another excellent piece of work uh, which dealt with a post-war uh, mass housing as shared national heritage. So another type of heritage, again not the monumental, the grandeur, the beautiful, but something which is still of heritage value but in a very different context. So, thank you. Um, hi. <laughs> um, Post-war mass housing and shared national heritage. Um, over the last 20 years, a sort of slightly unlikely victory, if you want to call it that, has been achieved. Um, whereas these buildings that are not only in the recent past considered as ugly, but as contributing to crime, social decay, urban degradation and the like, um, have been recognised at an official level at least as part of our national heritage through the listing process. Um, this sort of throws up the question, though, what do we do with these buildings now, and who does this benefit? Um, I think there's some quite unique questions within this sort of heritage, and uh, they don't really occur in other forms, and that was kind of the jumping off point for this study. Um, as the presentation consideration of buildings of this type as heritage is a reasonably recent phenomenon, there's not a huge amount of, sort of public literature to work from. Um, there was a sort of theoretical research sort of underpinning this, which I'll talk about in a little bit in a minute, but the primary part of the study was looking at some first-hand case studies and carrying out first-hand interviews um, to assess a few different sort of approaches um, actually being undertaken at um, listed and unlisted sites at the moment. Um, so what's unique about post-war mass housing? How is it sort of different um, from, you know, we've had mass housing in Georgian Victorian terrace streets, homes to heroes, garden cities, all that sort of thing. What makes post-war mass housing unique? Um, I would say fundamentally two things. Uh, an intrinsic connection uh, between housing and the welfare state, and an adoption of modernist architecture. Um, to very briefly talk about why that's the case, um, in the uh, immediate aftermath of World War II, um, there was a desire to try and look forward and to try and create something good out of what had gone before, and so rather than um, house just being a providing a home, there was sort of one thought about um, homes being light, being airy, being designed along scientific principles, um, providing modern sanitation, modern labour saving uh, equipment. Um, combined with that was a broader thought though, we weren't just providing housing, we were replanning bits of the city, so we were thinking again at the relationship between peoples and cars, density of developments, and amount of open space, combinations of housing and other sort of uses, so given the devastation and the opportunity to replan on such a big level, actually these buildings were doing a lot more than just providing housing, they were quite a sort of fundamental change in how we structured our society and our cities. Um, <coughs> modernist architecture was kind of having similar ambitions and similar aims, and um, also uh, similarly working with, given the condition and labour shortages post-war, rather than craft materials, rather than the Victorian sort of streets, <coughs> by brick layer, there's a lot more standardisation, factory production, mass production, um, again a combination of need and architectural aims. Um, Final thing to say is that um, this housing was provided prominently by the state, both from an ideological <coughs> viewpoint and out of necessity and to a certain extent. But again, really quite unique characteristics that um, led to this housing taking the form it does, which aren't immediately apparent to someone just by being at these sites nowadays. So engagement is a lot more than about being about physical access, it's about how you understand that white story. Um, the listing of these buildings is also quite interesting. Um, with the 30-year rule, um, so in 1987, English Heritage um, decided that buildings could be listed uh, a, uh, from 30 years after their completion, which was a much shorter time span than uh, in previous years. So, quite interestingly, buildings of this type have been listed at a much younger age, when they may be less uh, altered, when their existing architects may be alive. Um, so that's. Uh, provides some interesting, uh, actually provides a desire for them to be more protected in many ways. Um, also, there's so much of this stuff 
eligible for listing and therefore how we choose what we list and what we don't list. Um, we've been using architectural significance really as the driver for that, um, which, is, which means that the listed things aren't really typical of the time, they're atypical, um, which creates quite an interesting different contrast between listed and unlisted uh, buildings, which we'll come back to again in a minute. So, um, whose heritage is shared heritage? Um, if by inclusion on uh, as part of national lists of listed buildings, we're accepting that buildings of these type are part of our national heritage, um, what does that really mean? Um, at a very basic level, you could define national heritage as being um, a positive story about the great achievements of our nation as exemplified through artefacts and objects and cultural practices. As this quite amazing article from 1993 demonstrates, um, it is a process that is top down. Uh, so it is national heritage is defined by experts and professionals working within national and international frameworks. Um, Mass house, post war mass housing has become part of this story, even though that seems slightly unlikely. Um, through a drive for um, more pluralism in our heritage, um, this sort of uh, heritage has become absorbed into that dialogue. But the way this has been done is not by sort of allowing for uh, a wider variety of narratives and some of the sort of less positive narratives that still exist about its heritage, but by reframing this, these sort of buildings as visionary architectural achievements that talk about uh, a new way to imagine society. Um, so in this sense, it, this heritage has kind of been assimilated into, we call it AHD in Smith's terms. Um, so in that sense, national heritage really much, really very, isn't, isn't a representative, inclusive heritage. Um, the issue of whose heritage is heritage is also has for more practical issues when we get to case studies on the ground, um, sharing space between visitors and residents, um, the duplicity of narratives in buildings as dense as this, um, who actually benefits financially from, from heritage isolation. Spoiler alert, it's not the people who live there often. Um, <laughs> so uh, this again kind of brings up the sort of the distinction between listed and unlisted, um, which is kind of how I've ordered the case studies that I looked at. Um, so I interviewed quite a lot of people from heritage practitioners, people directing heritage work, and people engaging in heritage on the ground, and also looked at different case studies, try and pull out some themes and look at what is working, what is working less well at different sites. Um, what's really interesting is there's not actually that many sites that actually engage, if you like. So there's no museum of post-war housing, there's no building that is run as a you know, full-time heritage attraction. And this kind of vacuum, there's interest, but there's not really a lot of way to engage apart from just walking around the street, which doesn't really give you the full picture. So this vacuum has led to some quite interesting things. So at listed sites, um, at an extreme end, um, people who've got the means have taken upon themselves to move into these buildings, to be part of this heritage in that way. A lot of them were built, to, you know, built by the public sector, they would right to buy all those sort of things. People can put slots and move in. Um, this is probably people who are interested in the architectural history of them, that value these buildings for these reasons. Um, Keeling House, that was on the previous slide, for example, has 68 flats and there's 40 architects living there. So <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, uh, you can kind of see how that happens. So that, that's not a bad thing per se. What's really interesting, though, is that you end up with a real <coughs> concentration of people that value the site for one particular reason. So these quite great pictures of inside of Balkan Flats just show how narrow the, the aesthetic is and how you're almost defining the right way to live in these buildings. Um, and kind of sort of the Airbnb model, which again is a sort of way to try and engage with it, is very much when you look at it, you get these sort of mid-century pictures. And it's kind of humorous, but also it actually it leads to quite a lot of distance on the ground because there are people there that really don't value this heritage for these reasons, and by trying to narrow down that narrative, that can be problematic. Um, the second strand of a listed building is of the heritage attraction. Um, heritage organisations have really struggled to know what to do with this sort of heritage. Um, it doesn't really fit with the model, so 
Um, this is uh, the National Trust pop-up opening at Belfron Tower, a uh, 20 odd story concrete uh, gold finger building in West, uh, East London. Um, the problem with these buildings is they're, they're really big. They're on a huge site in central locations, so they cost a fortune if you want to buy them. There's hundreds of people living in them. Uh, it really doesn't, you know, it doesn't work with your country house model and all, all the likes. Um, so this was actually undertaken when the rest of the building was empty, but it, during a refurbishment. Um, and as you can see, it kind of presents, it's kind of like the barking images, it's kind of a, quite a sort of typical stylized view of a mid-century house, whether it represents the reality of what your home would be like if you lived in a social housing building in East London at this period is very doubtful. But that's, it, what's really interesting is that was kind of purposeful. From speaking of the National Trust, they were really concerned of being sort of accused of poverty poor, as they put it. So, um, sort of the disconnect between the status almost of the heritage organisation and how they work with more everyday buildings and with sort of these narratives, it, they really finding problematic. Um, there's a really nice example in New York actually of the uh, tenant, uh, New York Tenement Museum where through I think it's seven or eight flats, they present in a lot of detail the personal stories of the people who live there, but through those different stories of different people from different ages, it builds to tell you a story about immigration into that part of New York. And that felt, compared to what you get out of this, that felt, felt like a much richer and more interesting and more inclusive way to kind of try and tell these stories. So, you know, there are, there are things that people are doing that, that work, but we're not really there with a lot of them yet in this country. Um, the third method of engagement at um, listed sites is remote engagement. So, um, social media is brilliant for um, unedited, person-to-person, non-expert, filtered engagement personal narratives, telling stories, those sort of things. But the sort of media that we mostly engage with heritage through is um, mass media. Um, and so we get either very, the sort of the top line, the very sort of aesthetically fetishized utopian version of, of these places, or we get the very dystopian, you know, if there's a crime scene needed, it's normally a brutalist housing estate <laughs> or something that's <laughs> like, isn't it? And so it's, you know, it, we get a very sort of polarised narrative neither of which is really that accurate. So, um, unlisted sites have a bit more freedom to determine what they do because they're not governed by um, so much sort of oversight from heritage organisations. Equally though, they have less inclination to share their heritage and often the things that they're interested in are very personal and uh, things of local interest only, and there's sort of struggled to try and connect with the wider audience or to tell larger stories. Um, so the first structure I looked at for uh, enlisted sites, and this is quite an interesting one, is um, museumification, if you want to call it that. So the picture on the left is Robin Hood Gardens, which was quite controversially not listed and recently demolished at the time the Victorian Art Museum decided to buy a three-storey part of the building to add to their collection. And the pictures on the left show that bit of building uh, displayed with the Venice Biennale. Um, this was quite controversial. Um, the curator who was in charge of this told me he'd have death threats over it. People really felt very strongly about the sort of disconnection of the building from its social context and you know, the sort of aesthetic fetishization of it as a, purely as an object. There's, people felt really strongly about that. Um, I think there is some merit in this in a way. I think it sort of allows people to appreciate the building for that purpose, to do so without uh, bothering or affecting people who live in the building. It allows us to build, you know, building that English Heritage said um, uh, was unfit for human habitation, to not force people to live in it because we value it for a heritage reason. Um, but I think it comes down to how you tell the stories, how you get that sort of non aesthetic story in as well. So I think a lot of some of what they did at the Venice Biennale was to try and sort of weave in those narratives so you have the sort of social context and the personal stories as well. Obviously it's not an approach that can work everywhere, but it is an interesting sort of possibility that obviously you can't do with listed buildings. Um, second strategy with unlisted is um, a sort of social heritage focus. So in the absence of more aesthetic values, it is social heritage that is normally focused on. Um, as I mentioned, the, the stories are kind of likely to be quite Inward looking, you're sort of almost defining a community by defining who's not part of it some of the time. Um, so it's a sort of story for the local community, by the local community. Um, but still, 
there kind of needs to be a catalyst or an impetus for the community to do this. There's a lot of um, uh, nervousness about sharing ownership or authorship of uh, heritage with heritage organisations. They seem to appear to come with too much baggage for people to want to, residents to want to sort of engage with them. They don't feel like they're on equal terms, maybe. Um, so in lieu of that, artists have often um, been involved and do perform this job really quite well. So this is a project in Barking Dagenham, um, where an artist produced a sort of mobile heritage sort of museum that she took around various different states, collecting people's stories, telling narratives and sharing heritage. Really nice little project. Um, the final uh, strand that unlisted is uh, on-site intervention. So um, again, with unlisted buildings, there's more opportunity to do this. So this is Silchester Estate in West London, where a new uh, building was being built on an existing 16th estate. And the artist Nathan Coley produced a sort of tripartite work that talked about the site's history as the People's Republic of Frastonia. Go home and Google that, it's a really good story. <laughs> um, so in very quick terms, so um, he produced a large-scale sculpture that sat on the roof of the building facing the road and the tube line that tried to engage at a, a, a citywide level. Each of the residents got given a small-scale version of that sculpture to give more a personal connection to that larger sculpture. And then there's a publication produced that kind of ties them together and talked about why the form of the sculpture relates to the story and tells the story. So that felt a really nice project that it tried to engage at those different levels um, to give something first for residents but also to talk about a larger scale, you know, on a national scale. So in conclusion, um, shared heritage is really complex. <laughs> it's even more complex when you're talking about uh, very recent history and very contested history. You're talking about big dense sites where there's such a duplicity of narratives and they're still evolving and changing. Um, heritage organisations are really struggling to know what to do with these sites but there is growing interest, especially much younger people, to engage and to um, have involvement with these sites. Um, I think the things that sort of point towards um, a positive future are uh, where there's much greater collaboration. So the National Trust is doing a project at Spa Green Housing Estate where they are giving a lot more of the authorship over to the community and they sort of say we don't even know if there'll be a project at the end of it. Mm -hmm. We've just kind of started with a blank bit of paper and we're talking to the community about their aims and their thoughts about it and um, see what happens. And I think the probably the best example of that that I can give is there's a really nice building in Berlin, the Kabusia House, the Kabusia Housing Project, uh, where the residents themselves have bought a flat that they use as a tourist attraction. They charge the visitors, they take the tours, they take the money, they do interpretation, they do events for residents, and they run it all themselves. Um, they benefit from it, they learn about where they live, and they obviously love it. Um, and they also sort of share with uh, a wider audience. Um, so I think there are examples out there, but it's just thinking about these things in very different ways to how we typically think about engagement with built heritage. An excellent project. Uh, again, an indicative example for the diversity of the <laughs> subjects we have uh, listened to today. Uh, we have time for, for one. one question. <laughs> okay, so we have time for one question. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, Ian Harper and I work for Historic England. Um, just a few pointers. I have to realise that these decisions made by the, those government heritage organisations are usually made by art historians and not necessarily by technical people. And with reference to Robin Hood Gardens, um, what that place really wanted was a proper makeover and new bathrooms and new lifts and it could have lasted another hundred years had it been properly dealt with. And I think it's very sad. The, the fact that part of it's gone off to a museum somewhere is, is probably rather good because it's the only bit that's left. And um, there was a lot of value in there. That's just a point of that. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Andrea. It was really Just to give a small thank you. There's some chocolate for our speakers. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Excellent, and of course, all of the.
the sustainable credit students. You just saw a very small <laughs> uh, percentage of the students and it is really a great pleasure for all mm -hmm. of us to work with such a great, great, brilliant, uh, enthusiastic people. So thank you very much because we, you make our working lives so much more pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Drinks uh, because it's in a different venue. Uh, it might be wiser if you followed us. So we're gonna go together as, as, as a group. Hopefully, we're gonna find it. And before you go, I would just wanted to make an announcement, which I think we ought to have made at the beginning, which is that we have been recording this session and are planning to put the, the film online, which we we told the speakers, but I realise we haven't told the audience. So if anyone wants to uh, ask any questions about that, please just come up during the wine session and do so. Thank <laughs> you.